Live from the mighty Veedverks airship, I'm Travis Lippert, CEO of Verks Unlimited, Limited, better known as Veedverks. And I'm Julie Richardson, the Director of Commercialization and Promotions. And today we have with us Kelly Thornton from Left Hand Hemp and Four Elements Coffee. Thank you and welcome, welcome. Thanks for having me on. Oh, we are so excited. What did you do before hemp? Uh, that's a loaded question, but um, right after high school, eight years at the U.S. Postal Service mm -hmm. while getting a bachelor's degree in history mm -hmm. and then moved from history degree to a science degree for my master's, which was in hydrogeology. So I worked as a an environmental consultant mm -hmm. for six years leading up to 2012 when I moved out here. Sorry about that. Keep no problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, keep going, keep going. And then, uh, so when I uh, got laid off from that job in 2012, I was uh, kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do next and uh, saw an advertisement for a straw bale workshop uh -huh. with uh, strawbale.com. So I went to that and then I went to two more, um, got certified to teach straw bale. I'd always been a handyman, home remodel type mm -hmm. person. Um, so when I realized how amazing, sustainable, uh, possibilities are with home building I was gonna do straw bale until I discovered hempcrete right and then when I discovered hempcrete I'm like that's probably the way to go well I, I'm sure that you had a lot to think about as far as the fracking and everything that's going here in Colorado yep, I'm um, adamantly opposed to fracking <laughs> I was curious about that you know because everything about you is responsible and conscious and yes. um, so in this geology, the first thing popped into my head, I was just like, I wonder what, how he stands now is that that was why you got out of it. Well, so there's two roads you can take when you're a geologist. You can be a consultant, usually an environmental consultant, cleaning up the messes that spawn from industrial or petroleum type of settings, or you can go work for the beast, which is the oil companies, which a lot of people do right when they get out of college. Mm -hmm. And it's a nice paycheck, but I... I mean, aside from having to drive a car because there's no, you know, fully developed rail system, even in a place like Denver, um, you're stuck. But that's about all I contribute to the oil industry. And I did not want to go to work for them. Mm. Well, and, you know, unless you want to be a teacher or, you know, go around and do the archaeological, geological type things, which that would fascinate me. But that's not everybody's gig. That's it's not like those jobs are prevalent and everybody can get one when did you jump into hemp uh would have been so you you guys are familiar with ashley weber yes right so i i love was ashley's roommate her. from 2012 to 2015 so you know hanging out with her you're gonna go to some cannabis events just one or two <laughs> <laughs> so i went to a lot of cannabis events you know the 420 stuff the indo expo the um noco uh deals as they were coming up um mm -hmm. And just, I'd always had a curiosity about hemp because I knew, you know, being a history major, especially with a focus on World War II, that hemp played a crucial role up to that point, you know. Right. Shortly after they, you know, passed the Marijuana Tax Act, and then shortly before they re-outlawed it after World War II was coming to an end. Um, so when I found out you could build houses with it, you know, having uh, gone to a workshop and saw the application, at first I didn't think much of it. And then as I started reading more about it and was planning on doing a straw bale business, I was like, wow, I'd rather do hemp creek because it does have a few more benefits than building with straw bale, although they're both great. Mm -hmm. but... I'm fixing your name. You're fixing. Oh, no worries. You forget the N? No. Oh, you just. Well, how many ends are there? Oh, just the one. But in the middle. Well, I had zero ends. Yeah, I they want to say Thor. I had they our... say Thor ton. But then when I moved out here, it was convenient that there's a city named Thornton. Yeah. Because then all I have to say is like the city. Yeah. And now people are like, they get it. Like I actually that. live in that city well, of Thornton. <laughs> so tell us about hempcrete. What is hempcrete? Um, so hempcrete is taking the stalk of the industrial hemp plant, grinding it up and processing it to a specific size so it works well mm -hmm. when you mix it with a lime binder. And then you form it in the walls of a house around your standard wood frame. Um, and it's a breathable, non-flammable, insect mold resistant uh, substrate that gives you healthy indoor air quality 
and also uh, excellent acoustical properties. Nobody ever really talks about this, really? but if you live near train tracks or an airport, you can really deaden some sound with 12 inches of hempcrete. It's pretty nice material. A lot of sound studios are talking by using it because it's got such great acoustic properties. Well, but. and there you go. You know, every week, you know, this is such an exciting industry to be in because every week somebody has a new idea about something. You know, and it's the possibilities are just endless. Is it load bearing? Uh, traditionally, no, but there is a company in Canada who is. Um, they released their blocks, their hempcrete blocks, and they literally go together like Legos. They've got square dowels coming out of the top. So imagine the eight piece Lego mm -hmm. that you always need more of, you know? Right, yeah. Right. Um, that's basically how their blocks are built. But my understanding is, is you give them your house plans, mm -hmm. they'll custom make the blocks that you need and then you literally build the walls out of nothing but their blocks and it's just biofiber is the name of the company but um i don't know how commercially viable they are at this point but traditionally it's just insulating material so okay so insulating material mm -hmm. so how would you build a house out of it so there are um there's several different wall systems you can use traditionally what people like to do is build their frame and then bury it 100 percent within the hempcrete that gives you the most non-flammability um, as opposed to having some wood faces exposed the house i just did in uh tyler or sorry lindale texas um they had a double stud construction so on a 12 inch imagine having a 12 inch plate which is your bottom floor plate and top plate for your wall system and then they put two two by fours on the outside of those plates all the way down and you fill all the middle with hempcrete. So when you're done, all you see is the face of the two by four on the outside and a face of a two by four on the inside. And it, to me, it's the best locking mechanism. It's like an H shape that you lock that hempcrete in all the way through the walls of the house. But uh, to answer your question uh, more generally, you just get an architecturally engineered uh, stick frame you know, that's, they can stand up by itself and then you form the hempcrete in the walls and the hempcrete is your whole wall structure. So it's wood frame, hempcrete, and then plaster. And that's it. No fiberglass, no drywall, no latex paint, none of those things. Part of uh, the new construction issues that people have with new construction is they buy these beautiful new homes and they start getting sick they start having autoimmune issues and then come to find out you know maybe they're um having issues with the building materials you know um I, in the south formaldehyde is a big bad one you know because once you get the heating up of the building it releases those gases mm -hmm. hempcrete doesn't have any of those issues none <laughs> It's totally innocuous. I mean, you put it in and you get when you walk into a hempcrete house that's just been, you know, formed. Um, it's just this really nice earthy. It's almost like a clay smell. Mm -hmm. um, and once you plaster the walls, you're not going to smell anything. And the least of your problems are going to be off gassing. You don't have to worry about any off gassing of any materials. Usually the off gassing results from lately, depending on the type of insulation somebody sprays, you know, puts in mm -hmm. spray foam is pretty nasty stuff yes. in and of itself, you know? Um, and then OSB off gases for, you know, weeks to months after oh, yeah. you put in the walls. So you, you just get rid of all of those things. And you also can uh, do a lot of these sustainable houses without forced air heat. So there's no HVAC issues. There's no dust that accumulates and then just recirculates inside the house. Um, so you, and since hempcrete uh, works with the outdoor air and humidity and it, you know, moves it through the wall on a microscopic level, you're constantly kind of, it's almost like an air freshener, like a, like a air filter. Nice. You're bringing clean air into the house and you're, you know, taking air into and out of the house on a very small scale. Like I said, it's not like you can feel a breeze or anything. I don't want to give anybody the wrong impression. Uh, this is something you can neither see nor feel, but you know, it's happening. So it's actually a healthier house because you know, I know they've done studies on um, people with allergies and, mm -hmm. you know, like, once again, autoimmune issues. And they come to find out they live in these absolutely closed environments. They haven't opened their windows in years and sure. don't even know if they would open anymore. And that inside air is so much mm -hmm. more toxic, you know, and that's mm -hmm. literally what was making them sick. So to me, that sounds like you're starting off with a healthier home. Mm -hmm. 
And then um, also with, let's say you have a, a flood, either a broken pipe or an actual flood, um, you know, what's the first thing you have to do after the water subsides? You got to tear everything, everything out. out. So with hempcrete, since it's got an amazing ability to control moisture and humidity, um, I don't, I haven't seen any tests on like flood data, but the theory is, is it would eventually just dry itself out. And since it's very alkaline, you're not going to have a problem with like black mold or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, cuz that was the first thing that yeah. popped into my head. Is... I've actually got a client in Lawrence, Kansas who has a huh? condition that I've heard of, yeah, <laughs> that I've heard of uh twice in the last month. They can't process mold toxicity out of their body like most humans can. Mm. So they get really sick. It's like a full system crash if they get exposed to mold or mildew. Um so that's why she opted to build with hempcrete. They're doing a grow house it's called b2 as in t-o-o mm -hmm. love farm and they do microgreens so they want to build this thousand plus square foot grow facility out of hempcrete so they don't have an issue with mold in lawrence kansas mm -hmm. that's where yep. i grew up it was initially slated for mid-july but due to the excessive rains they've had this year and then that crazy tornado they had uh last week mm -hmm. or a week ago, whatever it was, um, they decided to push it back. So the actual seminar is September 8th through the 7th. And there's still plenty of seats available. I'm trying. You guys don't. Don't get interested in what I'm doing. <laughs> well, I thought you were fixing to drink up something. Uh. I was trying to look up in the name of a store. Um, now, you are certified to teach straw bale construction. Yeah, by, well, certified to do the straw bale part. So mm -hmm. one of the things I get into is people are like, oh, so can you build my house? I'm not a contractor. I can't, I could build the house, mm -hmm. but I'm not authorized in any jurisdiction to actually build the house. The insulation part, that's where we come in and we do the workshops. So I'm certified to teach by one of the experts, which is Andrew Morrison. Mm -hmm. um, I've got his certification. So it's not like it's a Boulder County or state of Colorado certification. So I just want to clarify, there's a little caveat to that. Yeah. But if someone called me and said, hey, can you build me a straw bell house? I could do it. Right. For sure. Well, my hippie trippy dream is to have an earth ship. Mm. Um, how does hempcrete compare to what they're making with the earth ships? Well, so I usually describe hempcrete as being extremely labor intensive, but it hasn't got anything on earth ships. <laughs> oh really yeah so for my money if i'm gonna go sustainable i'm not i tried you know i worked on a, a house build in um what's the canyon south of el dorado do you know i don't okay well there's a canyon up there where somebody was doing a hemp cre or a cob house and it was two years in the making i mean it takes a long time to stomp cob and then try to build a house with it I uh, relegate cob, for example, which is sand, clay, and straw. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an old Welsh word. It's not like corn cob, because uh, that's what a lot of people ask me. You build a house out of corn cobs? No, 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 no. It's earth. Um, but you have to stomp this stuff, get it to the right texture, then you roll mm -hmm. it into balls, stack it on whatever you're b building, flatten it or shape it. It's very great. To, I mean, it's like working with clay. It's like you're mm -hmm. sculpting. But I leave that to rocket mass heaters, which we can talk about that later. Um, or pizza ovens because you don't need so much of it. Earth ships are the same way. That's just a lot of dirt. And and there's been debate over, do the tires off-gas? Do they not off-gas? Yeah. Are they buried? For me, hempcrete's the way to go. Hempcrete or straw bale because it's a lot quicker than those two, the cob or the earth ship. So they're great. And I, I appreciate the whole system of gray water reuse and solar and wind and mm -hmm. using the earth to actually cool. But, but you we'll, can do it all with him, Craig. Yeah, we're essentially doing that just in on our terms. You know, we're mm -hmm. taking the earth and we're putting it in this box instead of building our house into the earth, um, which is what a lot of the airships do. Well, I know, you know, using hempcrete like this or straw bales and, you know, throughout the world, indigenous, you know, communities have used what they had, you mm -hmm. know. You know, you can use coconut fibers, you can use... Um, oh gosh, just any number of things, mm -hmm. you know, reeds. Are there any hemp communities that are combining other natural sources like that? I with don't hemp? know. I haven't, uh, haven't come across it. The only villages I know of are little communities are like, uh, a lot of people know the name Sergei Kovalenkov. Mm -hmm. He runs Hemp UA, Empire UA. Everybody knows yeah. Sergei Kovalenkov. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, anyway, so he's in the Ukraine and he's actually building what look like hempcrete villages. I mean, they're they're pretty intense. They do the domes. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he's miles ahead of the game. I mean, I, w- I want to get to where he's at. That's my goal. Yeah. Is he's 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 a great guy. Well, it's interesting. You were saying there were different formulations of strength. You know, kind of like concrete. Mm-hmm. You know, people don't realize. You know, what you have in warmer climates is completely different from what you have, like say in Denver, where you're going to have a lot of freezing and type mm-hmm. type of stuff. So the the different measurements come into play with the um, I guess the strength you need of the hempcrete. So in the walls, you're going to do a certain ratio. In the ceiling, you're going to do a lighter ratio, so it's not going to, you know, gravity's not mm-hmm. going to make it fall. Although if you put it in tight enough, it's not going to fall anyway. And then in the floor, it's a totally different mix because you can't walk on it. So you can definitely use it for insulation. Like if you just do a wood joist floor, mm-hmm. like on a gravel, you know, underlayment or whatever, if you're really going off grid, um, you can put it in the floor, but you have to put some sort of flooring over it, you know, just some natural wood or something like that. Um, but so that's the only, and they're very slight differences in the strength. It's not like concrete's probably got a different application for bridges versus foundation of a house, you know right, what I mean? So, blocks. Yeah. So that's a massive range. Hempcrete's not as, as, uh, spread out as that. Sorry. I've been experimenting a lot today with new camera angles. We shifted some stuff around. Uh, we're getting more and more serious about trying to make this look good so well hey i'm enjoying the ride it's a it's a great view out the front of the blimp there and (laughs) you're working you know getting back to indigenous communities you you've done a lot of work with building homes um i've done a lot of talking about building homes. (laughs) so so i went down and i gave two presentations for example to the taos pueblo one was the uh they have a split government one's like a war council Mm -hmm. and one's uh just the tribal council right so so i did a presentation for each one of those uh groups hoping that we could get some some houses being built down on the taos pueblo uh they do do a lot of adobe and there's a lot of straw bale down there as well um you know i i've given presentations to the um fort belknap reservation in northeastern montana and then I talked to the Crow Reservation in southeastern Montana in April. Um, and of course, you know, I'm, I interact with uh, Alex White Plume and Rosebud uh, White Plume a lot. And we're trying to get um, a Lakota Media Project building built on Pine Ridge. So they've got a facility to do all of their media stuff, um, which is right near where the war pony races are, which are every June 25th. So that's coming up as well. Um, But my goal is also, I've got an appointment to go up to the Colville Reservation in Eastern Washington. Um, My goal is is to get enough of a business going with Left Hand Hemp to where I can help contribute to those builds because of course finances are an issue for anybody building a house. But, um, you know, if you don't have an income, that's, you know, just a multiplier of, you know, thousands. Right. Well, I know there's, I'm aware of a a certain tribe that when we went and tried to talk about hemp because of problems with addiction and um, they're just as much targeted as any other uh, minority when it comes to uh, going to jail and, you know, you're the guilty one because Mm -hmm. you're, you're browner than this one, you know, they've dealt with that. So when you come in and you're trying, okay, we're going to grow hemp, the elders are like, no. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they don't want that. They they don't want any association with it. They think it's, you know, it's going to bring them either farther down. Are you finding the younger generation of indigenous leaders are a little more open? Uh, oh, yeah, actually. Um, so when I went to um, the Crow Res last month, I'm, I met a guy named Cody, and he's got a dispensary and everything. I mean, he's like, you know, gung-ho, he's, he's getting it. Um, and then when you talk about like Pine Ridge, um, if you watch the documentary Standing Silent Nation, it mm-hmm. talks about Alex and his struggle with the feds, which is just insane to me that they would bother with a reservation, which is supposed to be sovereign territory mm-hmm. out of the jurisdiction of the United States government. And yet here they come with the black helicopters and the machine yeah. guns. And this guy's growing hemp in his, you know, his yard. It's like, Really? Um, so anyway, but what I was going to say is, um, one of his, um, nephews is Tyson Whiteplume 
and Tyson's featured in that documentary when he's like three or five years old, or maybe he's six. I don't remember the dates, but, uh, and like you go look on Alex's, you know, Facebook page right now and, and Tyson's kind of leading the planting. He's like one of the, he's nice. probably going to, you know, take over for Alex, um, along with Rosebud. Um, so yeah, I do think the younger generations are really waking up to it. I think, you know, for as vilified as cannabis has been itself that, I mean, every, it's like everybody does it, you know, it's always been mm -hmm. <laughs> illegal, but oh yeah, sure. I smoke weed. You know, it's like all these people mm -hmm. freely admit to it, you know, of course, but, and they should be able to because it's a plant they can grow in their yard. Right. So when I go to these uh, reservations and give any talks at all, I do touch on cannabis because I want to make the distinction that this isn't alcohol. It's not meth. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you're going to be addicted to. As a matter of fact, it could probably wean some people off of things they're addicted to and then benefit their bodies anyway. So it's just like the distinction between recreational and medical. It's all medical, right? I mean, right. your body's benefiting from using this plant, be it hemp or high CBD, whatever, or THC, you know? Right. I've had the uh, extreme honor of being invited to prayer circles with different tribes. Hmm. And, you know, out of the majority of the prayer circles I've gone to, it's usually healing for a family that's lost somebody from addiction or they have a child that slipped into addiction or in that sort of situation it's just absolutely rampant um so i can understand why they wouldn't want to even listen but they've got to also understand this could be what brings them out oh yeah and that's that's another thing i mean think about if a tribe got a processing system like like mm -hmm. one of these turnkey like $2 million processing system that'll take hemp from start to finish and probably give them, I don't know what, five to a hundred marketable products right. when they're done. I mean, you can control Edison, your own destiny. You can know? you extract, sorry, I'm not going to get off my <laughs> Well, Can I just say that uh, Thomas Brand Edison, I'll keep saying it till somebody realizes how great of an idea this is. What is it? Um, Th Thomas Edison Brand Edison. If you're looking for globular protein, look no further than Thomas Edison brand hemp derived globular protein. I'm going to keep, it's not a real thing yet, but it's going to run into Can I tell, I, I would I like to tell people yeah. some, I, I do have some other real things though, real quick, if you don't mind. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Bubba Zorobnik, Jenny Gold. Uh, Jenny Gold's posted her GoFundMe. If you go uh, watch the show that we did up with her on Lyme disease, she could use your help. We'd appreciate it. The link is uh, in the comments here. And thanks to Doug DeRuin, Peggy Sue Kimmel, uh, Ben Ozwalo, um, Leandra Lucy, Wayne Austin, Karen Owen Peak. thank you all for joining. Please go share this out. Um, we're just talking about hemp. It's Hemp History Week. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'll tell you that too. Since it's Hemp History Week, I can't believe that I've, it's been Hemp History Week for almost a whole week and we haven't... Uh, done this live yet but we're running a heck of a deal at vedverks.com uh what's what is the deal with well you buy one it has to be the vedverks products yeah you know because so our vape cartridges e-liquids mm -hmm. um topicals, topicals at the regular price and you pick up any other vedverks products so let's say you want to get a cartridge and you don't need two cartridges but you want to buy an amelia your amelia will be half off whatever the lowest price is that'll be half off awesome that's so, a great deal. Yeah, it is Go a take great advantage deal. of that. You know, you could do, a little, there's Father's Day coming up, you know, yeah. buy a little happy for you and a little happy for dad. Cool. Um, also, I want to do NASCAR news real quick. So Let's the latest NASCAR on NASCAR news. is that we yesterday sent our lotion sample off to Utah to be tested at this lab um, that tests urine typically. And so I talked to the... Uh, yeah, I talked to the lab director. They said that they've tested uh, 80 products, 80 hemp products, and so far none of them have passed. So, and then also instead of costing $45 for a cannabinoid panel, it costs a thousand dollars, and it took <laughs> took a couple of days to just justify that to anybody. And since, really, I don't know. So, I'm betting my current. My current bet is that um, it's going to cost me, I'm gambling a guitar, and I was 
looking up. Uh, like that's what it is. It's a gamble. If none have passed, and it costs a thousand bucks to find out, but like I've got there. That's what's on the line. If this is a if this is a sucker's bet, and then it's impossible to pass, then worst case, I know I can sell that guitar, and it's an awesome guitar. Um, so uh, that's what we're betting, and that's uh, so they should get the uh, lotion tomorrow, and then they have twenty business days to get the results back to us, and then um, if they say yes, then this is a go. It better be a go. That is my understanding, or else I wouldn't be risking a guitar. So that's the uh, NASCAR update. And also I'd like to remind people to, uh, I posted a link in the description of this video. Please go vote for Stevie Day from Smoke and Bra up in Frisco, Colorado. She's um, in the running to win the uh, Inked Magazine Cover Girl contest. And uh, it's a small business. It's a cool business. It's a lot of local Colorado glass. They sell all our CBD <clears throat> products. They sell other people's products. And as a small business owner, a great big check for winning the uh, Ink Magazine Cover Girl Contest. That'd go a long way. And so uh, you can go vote once a day and uh, click the link in there. And I'm out of business to get through. So thank you. And get back to him. I hope Stevie does get that. That's going to be so exciting. For It'd her. be awesome. So I didn't realize you were having lotion tested. What would they find in the lotion that's going to? They're testing be... for the presence of THC. And there's, I mean, you're there's using no pepper. THC right. in it, no as THC. far as <laughs> you know. So we got we, them. If they come back and say anything, you know, there's been labs. But on none them. have passed. Yeah. That's the thing. None have passed. It's this is Gandalf Labs. Yeah, it is. <laughs> It's that's you shall. <laughs> hey, thanks, Mike. That's all right. Yeah, but um, somebody's got to do it in the background. Somebody's got to be the first one to pass, and I think it ought to be us because unless it, it's a setup, uh, unless it's a setup, and we're not accusing anybody of anything, but it just it took a, it really is a gamble. Like my CFO is like, no, no. My wife was like, right. <laughs> You know, you can't. Uh, so, yeah. Ult we're doing it, and I'm betting a guitar. Worst case, I'm betting a guitar. It's a pretty sweet guitar. Who's the bet with? The bet is with the universe. That oh. will be out of when zero companies have passed their tests. We're betting. I'm betting a guitar that we're going to be the first one. That's and if what, you lose, then you're just going to sell it. That's the deal? Uh, yeah, worst yeah. case, if... To replenish if, that thousand If bucks. we just burned a thousand dollars, worst case, that's my insurance policy. There you go. It's a night and that's exactly how I'm gonna solve that problem. I bet I can go pawn it for a thousand bucks. I bet I can pawn it for a lab test if if all hell breaks loose this turns. But I think we're gonna pass. You're gonna pass. I I I'm just gonna make the claim kind of, right now. The lab's in Utah and it's not exactly a hotbed of you know legit <laughs> cbd products right now mm -hmm. i mean so we'll find out um <laughs> it's fun oh tell you were talking earlier about just let's talk more about what is hemp creep it's not so is concrete with hemp added to it is that the um so basically it's hemp lime construction and of course, lime is a major component in most formulations of concrete, but this is just lime specifically. Um, there are three major companies that produce a proprietary binder. So you don't know what's in it, but you can guess. Um, it's usually some sort of amalgamation of type S lime, um, some volcanic materials, some pozzolans, clays. Uh, there were some that said they used my, maybe 15% Portland. But uh, Portland has a huge environmental footprint in its creation, so we like to, you know, not use it as much if we don't have to. But so it's not really like concrete because, like I said, it's not a structural Portland thing. type. Not. Can you tell us what Portland concrete? Portland cement. Okay, so Portland it, cement. It was a concrete formulated to increase curing times. It's stronger than other concretes, like traditionally up to the point where they started using it. I think in the 
I don't know if it's like between the 30s and the 50s, something like that. Um, I think there are variations of it that can cure underwater. So like for bridge wow. construction and stuff like that. So Portland's hard stuff, but it takes an immense amount of heat to cook the stuff that goes into it. You know what I mean? To get it to, you know, when you go to Home Depot and buy mm-hmm. a bag of it, all you have to do is add water and it's it's go time. So, um, but with lime, lime is just what's created from burning or, you know, cooking limestone. And basically... Here's some geology stuff. Limestone forms in tropical, tropical, shallow ocean water. So you've got all your, you know, your little sea creatures dying and falling to the bottom. And then you've got all this calcium carbonate in the corals and stuff like that. So that's where limestone forms. So that kind of lends to the whole continental shift movement. Because, I mean, you can go to Illinois. Most of the bedrock in Illinois is limestone. So it's everywhere. <coughs> you can go up to Wisconsin and still see the old lime kilns where they would actually mine the limestone and then cook it in these kilns and when you heat it you break it down into separate components that are used in various stuff you you could have a whole week-long seminar on limes and their uses and stuff like that but with hempcrete you take the lime plus the binder or if it's already mixed in one um what's an example of a a binder uh so tradical is one out of england vicat um bodichandra is the company out of france that kind of pioneered hempcrete construction in the last 30 years so that's their go-to material and that's what i like to is use. it like a plat like what is the binder it's a, is it's it a, a liquid or no a, no it's a, powder it's so powder it's a lime powder oh okay yeah so you so everybody asks me or a question i get asked a lot is well can you buy hempcrete like in jamaica when i'm doing the summer i'm like well you can't buy hempcrete anywhere you have to buy the separate components and mix it yourself and i don't know that'll ever change i don't think they'll mm-hmm. Because, I mean, you're already talking about a 55-pound bag of lime binder with a 33-pound bale. I mean, if you started mixing those things, (laughs) you'd have these gigantic bags of Mm -hmm. pre-mixed hempcrete, you know, but you still have to add water. So, basically, you buy the separate components, which I said were like the hemp herd, and it's got to be, you know, a pretty uniform size. I've used big stuff, but when you're packing this stuff down, you don't want you know, logs like this long, you know, Mm -hmm. as opposed to little wood chips. And basically when you chop this stuff up, I mean, it looks like wood chips. It's dried blonde Mm -hmm. wood is, is what the interior of the hemp plant is. So by taking that, mixing it with a lime, the appropriate amount of water, you get sort of a moist granola going on. It's kind of like oats that aren't really saturated. They're just kind of wet Mm -hmm. because you don't want to get it too wet because then you could have issues as it's curing. Um, So there's a sweet spot. And basically when you're doing a field test, you make a ball like you're doing a snowball and then you should be able to hold it upside down, have it hold its shape and then be able to squeeze it and it'll, it'll break. That's, you know, pretty consistent uh, mix that gives you a nice, you know, packing ability and dries relatively quickly. If you oversaturate it, that's a whole another. So you put up a stick house and then you let's like screw onto the two Mm -hmm. by fours. Yeah. We form uh, OSB most of the time. Okay. Just as a use for OSB. Anybody yeah. making hemp OSB yet? There are places in China. Or um, in strand board. Sunstrand, the company in um, Kentucky, they've got a, um, a hemp OSB dialed in. I'm not sure where they're at in the um, you know, marketable side of things. I don't yeah. know if they're selling it or not. I did get contacted by a guy from Germany, of course, because you know, they're the industrious mm-hmm. folks on the planet. Um, he's making OSB out of straw. And it's stronger than any OSB I've ever seen. Just four by eight sheets. He's got a factory in China. They're just churning them out. And I mean, there are so many incredible things you can do with natural building materials. And when you smell it, it smells like you're smelling a straw bale. It does not smell like chemicals like OSB does. So hmm. it's, there's, there's stuff out there and there's ways to do it. We just need to make the conscious shift from, well, we've been doing it this way and it's easy. Well, okay, let's not do it that way. Let's do it this way. Because, I mean, straw at the end of the day is an agricultural byproduct. It's trash, right? Um, And, of course, the difference between hay and straw is hay is cut green and stored so animals can eat it. still got all the chlorophyll and all that stuff. Straw is dead plant material that they just bail up because people use it for insulators, Mm -hmm. for bedding. Bedding. Um, And, uh, and of course, hemp herd, the very same thing we can use for hempcrete is used for animal bedding. And animals don't react to it because it's non- allergenic or it's hypoallergenic as opposed to straw which some animals have a reaction to so and it also clumps so straw is hay that hasn't been that wasn't cut when it was 
Well, so there's wheat straw. I mean, so there's a whole myriad of, of there's rice straw in Japan, for example, in my uh, straw bale mentor said he's built houses out of those and they're like bricks. He said it's so dense, the straw, compared to wheat straw, which is fairly, you know, fairly light when right. it's dry. Okay, so, it's, so it's after they cut the wheat and they take you know, all the grain, then you're left with the, the stem of the plant. So then you go back and you cut that and you bale it and then you've got straw. But it's dead you know, for all practical purposes. Alfalfa and stuff is harvested green so that animals can eat it. But I'm not a farmer. I'm just... Well, you know a lot about straw. You know more about straw than anybody who I (laughs) talk to about straw. Well, that's great. uh, So then hay. You're not saying that hay is leftover wheat that they... No, no. Hay is... So hay is whatever material... So mostly it's clover, right? I mean, alfalfa, clover, whatever they feed cattle and horses most of the time. To qualify it as hay, my understanding is, is that it's cut while it's alive. So it's green. Like as opposed to leaving wheat in the field until it goes from green to dead, tan. So straw is agricultural waste product that you're not going to use for anything else. But there's still plant material there you can use, like I said, for straw bales, bedding, cookouts, bonfires, and whatever whatever mm-hmm. you want to do. Um, yeah, so straw is a dead plant material. Hay is harvested live. That's all. What silage? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I think it's another grain, right? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not nuanced so on all the old grains like sorghum so, and all this other mm-hmm. stuff. So, but I think we should get back into all that agrarian stuff and get away from so much use of wheat anyway. But so it's, nobody makes a hay bale house, though, right? It's a straw bale house. Right, right. It's Actually, like, the funny thing, if you study, so straw bale houses started in Nebraska because the settlers were coming across. They started building shelters, but what does Nebraska not have a lot of trees? Mm -hmm. So there wasn't a lot of lumber. So they started using hay, but they had a problem with cattle eating their houses. (laughs) (laughs) So if there was any exposed part of the house that you're not done with yet, or you haven't adobe mudded or whatever they used to cover them back then, you have a possibility of critters coming up and just eating your house. So then they moved on to straw bale. And some of those original straw bale houses are still standing even left to the elements for 150 years, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a good building. All these sustainable materials, you know, you'll always, always get asked, well, how long will it last? It'll mm-hmm. last longer than your conventional house. Yeah. Oldest house that I know of with hemp components, not hempcrete necessarily is in Nagano, Japan. And I think it's 1698. I mean, there's a house that old that's got wow. hemp thatch and probably hemp in the plaster. And I mean, it's crazy. Does it, <laughs> Now, when when I built this house and explained it for everybody watching, what they did was they had two pieces of plywood. And in between the plywood is where they would put the hempcrete. And you're talking about packing. And what they had was basically it was a, a board about so long with a handle on it. Mm-hmm. And literally in between these two pieces of plywood, they would you know, pound the hempcrete Mm -hmm. down and get out all the little air pockets. Now, if you were, you know, once it dried, then they take it off and I would propose they probably put on some kind of drywall. Now, doesn't that seal it when you put on drywall and paint it, doesn't that kind of knock down the breathability? It does. There are permanent shutter options you can use. Like I know a lot of people are talking about magnesium oxide board, Mm -hmm. which is different than gypsum, uh, which is what your drywall standard, um, made out of or whatever um so a couple of things one when you form the walls um you want to so the air trapped in the wall is what gives you your insulation right in fiberglass or anything else so the more you compact the hempcrete the lower the r value goes now they always say it's between an r2 and an r3 per inch um you're probably gonna get closer to the r2 if you're in there with a tamper mm-hmm. so what i tell students or participants when they come to my workshop is if you just press it down with your hand you know, mm-hmm. tight enough, just, you know, hand, pat. that's perfectly good. It, it's going to look looser when you take the forms off, but it's going to be better for insulating. Um, now, when you get into tight corners, um, I usually take a tamper and go around the edge of the forms, mm-hmm. and then I just kind of smash the middle down by hand. Um, but there's a sweet spot, you know, and there's no way, I mean, when you're putting it in by hand with 30 people, there's no way to regulate, like, <laughs> how much is getting tamped on, you know, section A or B. But the general rule of thumb is, is don't smash it in like you're, 
you know, yeah, you just kind of fill yeah. it up and make sure you, right. you know, and just get it in there. And so after 20 to 30 minutes, you can take the forms off mm-hmm. and it should stay right where it's at. Um, and then you either move the forms up or you can keep going. Um, the key thing about getting those forms off is it allows it to start drying right away. Um, but it, you know, it could take months to cure. So you have to get that inner wall moisture percentage down to 15% or lower before you start putting the plaster on. Because if you plaster it, you know, it's a, it's a wood. So you've got all these lignans and all this stuff that'll leach out into the plaster if it's still wet. So unless you want a marbled look on your plaster, I'd wait, you know, until that, you know, humidity is out of the wall. Um, and sometimes that means that, like, if you're in a tropical climate, it's probably going to take longer to cure mm-hmm. than if you're in Colorado, where everything dries out in two seconds. Well, it had such an interesting texture when I was looking at it. I was kind of like, shoot, if this was mine, I don't think I would. I would cover it up. Sure. Because it really had an interesting texture. Um, it was pleasing, you know, and it kind of, if you have any type of artistic tendencies, you know, you can start thinking of things that, you know, you can mm-hmm. do to to spruce it up but it really isn't an unattractive finished product as a wall in itself yeah it looks great the only thing um about leaving it exposed is then <clears throat> stuff's going to start working on it i mean so i've got a shed the, the first project we did in uh, 2016 we just did a little eight by ten shed and uh, i only plastered like half of it so half of it's exposed i mean it's buying you know wind snow rain sleet hail mm-hmm. it hasn't done anything to it um did the shed have a floor yeah i just did a wood subfloor and just regular concrete under that uh actually this shed's pretty mobile it's just sitting on those deck blocks okay so with two by six framing and then all that stuff but uh that's because you know i'm on somebody's you know it's a rented piece of property so if i had to move it i could just get some forklift and pick it up and put it on a flatbed or something but I mean, you could do whatever kind of foundation. We can get into foundations all day too. So rubble trench is my favorite. It's where you dig your footings. You put in angular gravel. Well, first you put in a French drain mm-hmm. with a filter sock so you can get you know water away from your foundation. And then you put an angular grain, you compact it, and then you slowly get to smaller gravel as you go up. Mm-hmm. And then you put a concrete beam on top of that rock foundation. That lessens your use of concrete infinitely you can also do you know concrete pillars if you really want to build something big and have it well supported but when you get that gravel packed in there nice and tight it's a nice you know water can move through it Mm -hmm. you know it's it's not like um concrete where you're sealing everything off it's impermeable uh it's huge environmental footprint so you can use hempcrete for footings no 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 that's that is the footing and then you put the hempcrete on top of the (laughs) the concrete wall yeah no you don't use hempcrete for footings because then you're your stuff's going to crumble. Yeah. It, you know, but yeah. I'm like, oh. I honestly didn't know that until today. So I'm like, I've learned a lot. Just, oh, good. good yeah. In fact, I think they should call it hemp solation instead of hemp. <laughs> yeah. And I don't because want to run out of time before we talk about your co- new coffee shop. Oh, sure. Sure. So, you know, aren't we running up on the hour? We're getting yeah, really close here. Already, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about this so, fabulous new coffee shop. Where's it at? Oh, so it's in Lyons, Colorado. It's 4065 Ute Highway. So it's as you're going into Lyons from the east, mm-hmm. heading west towards Estes. Um, it's at the Ute Pump It. It's just a food truck, like trailer, you know, mm-hmm. tow behind trailer. Um, so basically, long story short, when I went back to college to get my master's, I started working at a coffee shop. Didn't really drink coffee. Like my dad, who drank it all day, I used to make fun of him. Like, it's 100 degrees out. Why are you drinking hot coffee? Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh, I get it. You know, after I started working at a coffee shop. Um, and I used to be able to drink coffee until 10 o'clock at night. Now it's one in the day and I'm done. Um, but I always thought that was the funnest job I ever had was working in a coffee shop. Because what are you doing? You're you're like pouring liquid happy. You know yeah. what I mean? People are wanting to talk to you. They're chatting. They're tipping as you're uh, getting all their coffee. Plus, uh, we had an awesome baker. baked goods. I was actually called the coffee hound in Bloomington, Illinois. It's one of the best coffee shops still, even having traveled the world, that's where it's at. But anyway, um, so I always thought it'd be cool to own my own coffee shop because I love to bake. I like to make coffees. Got a home espresso machine at the recommendation of my former boss. That's like the most, it's the closest you can get to an industrial grade home espresso machine. Mm -hmm. Um, So make lattes for people all the time. Like, man, you gotta open a shop. Six years ago, I tried to open a shop with a GoFundMe tech and really sad stories the only thing that raised money mm-hmm. on crowdfunding anymore so that was a no-go 
Uh, but I have a friend who runs this uh, gas station business, and he, you know, we've been talking about it. It's a former neighbor of mine next to Ashley, actually. Um, and we just went for it. So we've been home for three and a half weeks. It's kind of starting to pick up. Uh, but it is all organic. So that's one thing I want to stress is when people come there, they know they're getting high quality ingredients for about the same price as all the rest of the coffee shops. And that's really saying something for Boulder because Boulder's usually, you know, organic, vegan, vegetarian, mm-hmm. all this stuff. But there aren't any all organic coffee shops. So I kind of wanted to start a trend. And eventually I'd like to have an off-grid hempcrete, <laughs> you know, building Mm -hmm. you know as off grid as i could have it and still run a business with you know 1500 watt machines going you know making coffee and stuff so and you don't just have coffee you have uh baked goods as well baked goods um generally i try to stick to that on the weekends because the traffic's much heavier of course when everybody's going up to estes um but i lost my train of thought but there's also i want to do additives like uh I want to try to do CBD shots if people want mm-hmm. CBD, MCT oil, mm-hmm. if people want MCT oil in their lattes, you know, stuff to kind of make the latte healthier. I want to do, I haven't gotten to this yet, but I want to make my own cacao chocolate <laughs> for the mochas, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So, yeah. That Sorry. sounds amazing. <laughs> Is cacao Travis, a funny word? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's a joke about cacao. <laughs> and he, I we need can't, to have nobody that. can say it around here without I, him doing I that. I need to. <laughs> You'd be surprised that's how many times I hear the word cacao in this office. Oh, that's, <laughs> like, that's or interesting. in this airship, I should say. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I'm trying to be a different coffee shop than, than all the other coffee shops. So when people stop, they're delighted. They get a thing. You know, I've got a little garden area that I built with basically plants. They're vegetable plants instead of flowers because why not grow food if you're going to grow anything? Flowers mm-hmm. are pretty, but I'd rather eat, you know the end of the season i'll have lots of peppers and yeah all that stuff there's a lot of herbs out there but um anyway yeah i just wanted to do a different coffee shop so the four elements thing is uh um you know i'm kind of hearkening back to the ancient elements Mm -hmm. and when i do my off-grid thing i want to link the ancient elements to four renewable energy sources and i also thought about doing a like if i have somebody white label my own coffee i can call it the fifth element oh nice just kind of as a funny thing because you know, everybody liked that movie that's, yeah. that saw it back in the day. But I just thought it was kind of cool. Although I think the fifth element is actually cannabis. Just saying. But not really coffee. Was it the... Never mind. <laughs> Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll ask off here. <laughs> I don't want to have to go edit it back out. No. Um, <laughs> all right, which movie had the three boobs in it? That's Total Recall. Yeah, okay. Total Recall. And Paul, did you see the movie Paul recently about the alien? Yeah, where he's a graphic yes. artist, Simon yeah. Uh, Pegg. Yeah, All right. And then on his picture, alien with <laughs> three chesticles right here. So, <laughs> for the house, for the you put up the two by fours, and you said that our value is two or three per inch. So I'm still a little bit confused about how you go about building the hempcrete house, like the structure. So if you do the double stud construction, like I was saying. Oh, so two studs. Yeah, you can do the two studs. Well, no, that's fine because that's just one of the many ways you can do it. That to me was like gold. This is the first house that I'd done with the double stud. All you have to do is put your forms on the outside. There was no spacing. So it was just like, and you're done. Yeah. So I'm a huge fan of the double stud construction. So you do double stud construction. And then in between the studs, you know, you've got the hempcrete wrapping all the way around three faces of that two by four. Yeah. And then connecting it to this side wrapped all the way around so it's this nice h you know channel lock basically that really locks the hempcrete in there sounds like it's more what are the advantages of hempcrete over um traditional building techniques so like i said if you seal the the wood with the hempcrete if you put that the wood in the middle or even i mean all, the wood's almost always almost 100 percent encompassed anyway but what it does is it reduces the odds of your house burning mm-hmm. because hempcrete cannot be lit on fire. I mean, at most, if you've seen the torch tests on YouTube, it'll make a nice cherry spot where the torch is focused right on it Yeah. Um, for like an hour. And that's all it does. I mean, it's not going to, it's not going to go up in flames like any traditional house. Um, straw bale can catch on fire, but it's more of a smolder. And two of the houses that survived that um, span of California wildfires, I think a year and a half ago were, um, hydraulic lime plastered straw bale houses 
directly in the line of fire didn't do anything except discolor the plaster, which every other right. house in the path burned to the ground. Right. So, I mean, sustainable building, same with cobs, same with earth ships. I mean, you can't burn things <laughs> that aren't flammable, right? So, I mean, it, that's the biggest advantage to me. Um, plus, the indoor air quality is another huge advantage. You, your house isn't sealed with Tyvek and OSB to where you're just breathing whatever you know air you have in there, trapped in there with your air ducts and, and all that stuff. So, um, And then the ability of hemp to attract moisture. Um, I think one of the tests that um, I quote often that's in one of the Magwood books is it can hold a half a ton of moisture in a seven by five by 12 inch wall section without deteriorating a half a ton of moisture. I mean, that's, that's a lot of moisture, right? Yes, thousand it is. pounds of moisture. Um, so like, that's why I would love to test. I'd love to put a hempcrete wall just like I live on left hand Creek, just in the water <laughs> and let it get fully saturated yeah. and pull it out and then just watch it dry out with no molding, Film it. no deterioration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's all kinds of uh, benefits, but like I said, at the end of the day, you know, you're building with a, um, it's another industrial use for hemp. Once you've grown it, extracted, or I mean, cut off the, uh, the tops for your industrial hemp seed, not CBD, uh, you can still use all of that plant all the way down to the root, but for hempcrete, you know, you're using all the stock material. Um, so it's, there's no end to the benefits really, I guess is my point. Do you set the windows <laughs> toward the outside? Whatever you the want. the big thick wall or toward the inside? Same it's with um, most sustainable building. You can put them on the face, which is probably the easiest. And then you just build like a shadow box mm -hmm. on the inside. So you've got a shell if you've got this nice little thing. You can also, I know in the straw bell houses, they do these sweeping entrances to the windows and doors. Yeah. So it lets in the maximum amount, um, amount of light, especially if you're doing a south facing building so you're trying to get all that solar gain you know coming in your windows and your doors um it's better to have those sweeping so i like the wall or the windows on the outside with a kind of a shadow box on the inside i think that's the cool way to do it that way you don't have to mess with the sill and all that on the outside because sills always seem to be a place where windows tend to rot if they're not installed properly so you live on left hand creek mm -hmm. or you're, okay that's where my little camp is First, I thought maybe you were left-handed, and then I thought maybe it's because of all of that smashing, that hemp, <laughs> hempcrete. No, just I'll go on record and say I'm actually right-handed. But uh, no, so I didn't realize when I moved out here, you know, you see everything when you go to a geographic area is like left-hand this and left-hand that and left-hand this. It took me a while to realize that left-hand was actually an Arapaho chief uh, that in typical colonial fashion, they wipe out the indigenous people and then name everything after them. I'm like, okay, doesn't really make sense to me. But so I, I wasn't doing any kind of cultural appropriation. I live in Left Hand Canyon on Left Hand Creek. So it just came to me as being natural to say Left Hand Hemp. Um, but I did then go and do research on Chief Left Hand. There's an amazing book that somebody wrote locally that's a nice thick history of all of Left Hand and the Arapaho and the Ute in this area, actually. So once again, the coffee shop's on Ute Highway, right? So. Um, anyway, so yeah, so that's where left hand hemp came from was just all the geographic names of everything around here. If somebody okay. wants to get a hold of you, how do they do that? Um, we're at, uh, we're on left hand hemp on Facebook and Instagram. Um, learnhempcrete.com is the website. And then four elements is the same. It's on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Don't have a website for you yet, but my phone number is listed all over those things. So they could call emails, uh, Left hand hemp at Gmail. And that's it. You know any jokes? Do I know any jokes? Oh, no. I always go to the Eddie Murphy one that he tells to the kids and delirious because <laughs> can't do it. It's all right. No, I don't know any right off the top of my head. Do you believe in Sasquatch? Sure. Why not? I, I believe in aliens more than Sasquatch, I think. Me too. Yeah. I think Sasquatch is an alien. I'm going to call be, into, uh, hopefully uh, I'm trying to call into somebody else's podcast and talk about uh, the black triangle that flew over my house when I was in eighth, eighth grade. Oh, I could tell you a story about that I thought was a ghost, but I don't believe in ghosts. I think there's aliens and interdimensional creatures or something, you know, but I had a pretty freaky story when we were kids. Like I touched something that felt like a human back <laughs> and it okay. wasn't. So why don't you start at the beginning and just walk us into this experience? Okay. So 1977, 
guy in a beautiful red Monte Carlo pulls up and I'm five years old. Turns out it's the cable guy, right when cable comes out, talking to my dad about getting cable. So of course my parents get cable. Well, what didn't we have at the beginning of cable? Parental guidance or any sort of supervision. I saw the Phantasm, I saw the Omen, I saw the Exorcist, I saw the Fury, I saw Jaws. Tommy surprisingly freaked me the hell out as a five or six year old with the who, you know, mm-hmm. especially the scene. All I remember is beans blowing out of the TV and this woman <laughs> writhing around on this. I don't know. It was crazy. But so I was scared of the dark when I was a kid because I saw all these ridiculously horrible. You know, the 70s mm-hmm. movies didn't really interject a lot of comic relief like the horror movies now. Mm-hmm. It was more like and people are going to die in these movies very grotesquely, you know. So anyway. We moved out to the country, lived in a mobile home at the time. I had two younger brothers. So old younger Kel Kel's thinking that this little exorcist girl is behind every door that's open, right? Just waiting to jump out. So we used to do this thing where if one of us had to get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, somebody else was going with us. (laughs) And uh, so this one night, the three of us, you know, we always shared a bed for the most part when we were little. We're sleeping in this bedroom at the end of this mobile home. And all you had to do was walk out the door to the right. There's the bathroom. So I sit up in the middle of the bed and I'm like, hey, you know, because I was so scared of the dark when I was a kid. Now I just kind of laugh at it. Um, Are you I'm, sure? Yeah, I'm positive. Uh, now I just worry about bears and cougars out mm. where I'm at. So because they're around all the time. Um, so I sit up, I put my hand on what I thought was my middle brother's back. Well, our youngest brother would always get up and you'd hear him just, you know, tearing out to get behind us because he didn't want to be left behind because we were all scared of the dark when we were kids. Um, So I'm up walking and I hear something behind me. I thought, oh, that's probably just Lenny, my youngest brother. And uh, I take literally like five steps, turn right, because this is on the left side of the building and then the bathroom's right here. And I get to the threshold of the room and whatever I had my hand on was gone. It like down the hallway as silently and as shadowly as you can imagine. And it was just gone. And this was a warm back that I had my hand on. What I heard behind me was my middle brother getting up. My youngest brother was still in bed. And to this day, I mean, we were on some guy's ghost show like two years ago because he would do these random stories. Mm -hmm. And my brother and I still vividly remember this thing, you know, and I'm like, so I don't believe in ghosts. So I was like, had been an alien. <laughs> I don't know what it was doing in this little two acre plot of land in the middle of central Illinois in this little mobile home, but it actually happened. I mean, I- So you couldn't see it? You, you just had your- Well, it was on? pitch black, yeah. So I just pitch sat black. up and I put my hand, you know, I thought, you know, just on my brother's back. And uh, yeah, I mean, the only thing, once my eyes adjusted, it looked like a shadow just all the way down the hallway was out, just gone without a sound. And I was just like, I just remember turning my brother in slow motion being like, what the hell was that? And he's like, I don't know. And then that was it. But yeah. it stuck in our psyche from, so do you think, <laughs> from pre-junior high an, school to now. Was it an alien or uh, like an interdimensional being? I have no idea. Sasquatch. A human from Could've the been future. Sa- no, it wasn't Sasquatch. It was too bald. Sasquatch. It was Sasquatch, yeah. Time traveler. Look, don't Time try traveler. and shove sta- Sasquatch into one... <laughs> Some, some of them you know, are bald backs. Some of them are swimmers. Right on, right on. Because every culture has a, a Sasquatch story, you know. Sure, sure. I'll never forget going camping. My little brother, we were going in, I think, up in the Smoky Mountains. He yells out the window, Sasquatch, the Richardsons are here. <laughs> we want to talk to you. And I'm like, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> Don't invoke Sasquatch. <laughs> They'll get you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's it's crazy. I mean, all the weird, and there's been other weird things that have happened too. So just kind of makes you think, you know, mm-hmm. what's going on. Um, it does. And we'll have to have a little conversation on Atlantis. Oh, yeah. Because mm-hmm. of where Atlantis Lamar is actually and... located, not where they think it was. But... Mm-hmm. And if they built it with hemp free, <laughs> that's it right. Lost the it would be. Could have dried out, right? Be better insulated. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we're going to try and end on a, on time. All right. Uh, Kelly Thornton from Left Hand Hemp and Four Elements, Elements Coffee, Coffee yeah. in Lyons. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much for joining us. It was Thank fascinating. You.
Um, thank you, Julie, as always. Thanks. So we, we will be at the Build Jamaica Expo next week. I just wanted to Oh, I'm sorry. Out. No, that's yeah. fine. Oh. I just wanted to make Build sure. Build Jamaica that. Expo. Yeah, it's 2019, and they're doing a house. They give away a house every year. So they asked us to come down and, and do the What's hemp creep portion of the build. Grow Hemp Colorado's uh, supplying the hemp herd. So nice. it's going to be a cool little deal. It starts the 16th. Hmm. Be sure to go to vverks.com and we're running a good sale. Mm-hmm. Buy one, get whatever that costs less half off as long as we make it. That's right. So there you go. Uh, thanks for joining. We'll be back tomorrow with Eric McKee. Mm-hmm. And that will will just lead us into future Saturday hemp festivities that we'll tell you about tomorrow. But uh, as always, I'm Travis Lippert reminding you, if you don't get hemp here, get hemp somewhere. Cool. I wasn't expecting the